So your comment about the incidence of the viewer relative to the paint, it, when you were saying that, it reminded me of Dan Christensen. Mm -hmm. And his, remember, he did airbrushing, but he also started working with and experimenting with interference paint, so, which is a, a chemical sort of switch. But, so you'd see something on one angle, but at another you don't. So it gives that element of surprise, but also I never thought about it, like, in your context, which is, you know, because Dan just did those big loops, you know, and he was using a lot of metallic paints as well, and so he was trying to break things up because of the monotony of using the circles and the loops, um, and the paint became a whole other element as this was being invented, these things, because this is back in, this is some French company back in the 70s, I think, and so he was working with them to experiment and, you know, play around with it. And, um, but it was, you know, very effective and, mm. um, you know, really completely changing just the acrylic paint. But, um, but you, you don't work with any interference. I did. You? Oh, you did? Oh, okay. I had a whole body of work uh, when I was in But these the, don't have interference paint in it. These have, but earlier, no, these are acrylic. Oh, okay. Um, but I did a, an entire body of sculpture that I received an, a, a a grant or award mm -hmm. from the state of Michigan to work with um, interference paints because they're extraordinarily expensive. Mm -hmm. A pint can be a $400 investment. Right. And so because I had technical skills that allowed me to spray it, I wanted to use the interference paint uh, it, it, with pattern. So I did a, a four or five sculptures using interference paint on the oh, surface. Okay. And of course, it's again that, it changes the relationship between the viewer and the object. Mm -hmm. The object then becomes a verb. It, it creates a verb situation rather than a static noun. Mm -hmm. Thing versus. So I did explore that and I probably did two, maybe two years, mm -hmm. but I found it to be, uh, I, I think I, I'm sure you could figure out a lot of different ways to use it, but it is a limited paint and it's very costly. Yeah. And I did paint patterns on sculptures mm -hmm. um, and used that idea and had a few shows with that idea. Well, and Matthew Pincala, who I think you know. Pardon me? Matthew Pincala. Yes. He was at, in Detroit. He studied at Cranbrook. And he liked messing around with uh, interference paint, but I always wondered why he would just like do a few dots here and there, and that's probably why as a student, he was probably financially limited on how much he could do. But it, it was interesting because it would catch, totally catch your eye. It you does. Know? And then you kind of back up and you're kind of going, ah, and then you can move again and you see it and you don't, and so you're kind of like, so then you're thinking, oh, there must be some light or something <laughs> reflecting on it. Right. But that's the really interesting thing is that it really makes you engage and re-engage and re-engage until you sort of figure it out. It's sort of like playing with your cat with a little, one of those lights on the floor. Laser lights, yeah, right, laser exactly. Light. And so, uh, but it has the same effect on a human. <laughs> it does. You, you want to chase it and figure it out. But, um, but so that's very clever. Just conceptually, yeah. I think the use of that paint, because it it's, has a lot of uses in industry, is mm -hmm. uh, a different, very many different yeah. things. But um, it does, in the 60s and 70s, a lot of sculptors were looking at the relationship, of, many artists, of the relationship of the viewer to the thing, or yeah. the text to the author, to the reader. Things were switching, positioning mm. was switching. Right. And I think that became an interesting concept to work with. Mm -hmm. And um, a, acrylics were introduced using um, interference paint, but I was using actually urethane-based which were automotive and those were right. so really expensive. <laughs> Did the auto industry use interference paint? Oh, yeah. yeah. Was it just detail or was it actually... I've seen whole cars in Detroit and I've seen whole cars in, oh, okay. in New Mexico where I live now. But, um, Did they seem like a seersucker suit? Or, I mean, I mean a, a shark skin suit or what? <laughs> yeah, I think the idea is that you know, you're, you're moving, they're moving, yeah. and the object is shifting before you. It's a shape-shifting thing. Yeah. So, well, shark skin fabric's fantastic. Yeah, right? right, so it's reflective. Yeah. So all of that is about a kind of, if you bring it down, it's about uh, believing what you're seeing mm -hmm. and altering that reality and suggesting an alternative to the fixedness of life. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue of my work, meaning 
We're not fixed in time and space. We're not fixed by our gender. Mm -hmm. We're human beings and we can be uh, fluid in, in so many ways yeah. instead of deciding who and what we are. Um, so I think the paint and even pattern and color shift up is, is always about that as a concept for mm -hmm. me. No, no, that's nice. I mean, there's a nice, very uh, conceptual undertone to these, um, to your works in general. You may not get it when you look at it, but... Oh, exactly. And, and that's why I wanted to do the video, because I think in, to have, in your words, you describing, because when you and I talk, I mean, I know there's so much depth in your thinking about your work. I mean, you, of course, teaching, you spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to explain this to students. And, but also for your own work, just yeah. trying to figure out these things. But because you, you know, this sort of revel in um, materials and, I do. and really enjoy that, and you really like mechanical process and, and you know, complete hands on sort of work yourself, I mean, it would be impossible for you to have an assistant to do any of this. I, do, <laughs> I, I frankly that. don't want, I have assistants <laughs> that do, that I love and adore, but they do all the digital work for me. It's very important to me, uh, at a certain point I wanted to, I realized a lack of skills and I'm just one of those people that really needs a heavy skill base. Yeah. And so everything I need to make my work, I've learned. Yeah. So I'm a, quite a skilled fabricator and it's empowering. Yeah. There's an empowerment to knowing how to well, use Well see that's like, equipment. even um, like the way I sort of do, run the gallery, it's like I love meeting the artist and figuring out which artist to bring in to the fold and how they relate to all the other artists. So how I sort of curate the program at a higher level is just something only I could kind of do because I just kind of have it up here. And yes. It's really, it's more here and here, you know, sort of more how the emotional way I feel about the work and, um, you know, and often the artist too. So because you have to have this ability to have some engagement and interaction yes. with the artist and get yeah. along. The other thing then too is how you talk about the work. So that's why the writing becomes so important to me um, because I need to be able to understand the work to get into it, mm -hmm. to write about it and to try and, and place it with people and help people understand it and the complexity of it. Because a lot of the stuff people think of it as like, oh, I could do that, you know, especially when you're dealing in abstraction. You know, where people say, oh, my kid could do that, you know, sort of thing. It's like, eh, it's a little harder than you think, <laughs> you know. Could, could you? <laughs> you know, because you get into all the things you just said. It's about repetition. It's like, oh, I can't do that. It's like when you're writing, oh, I can't use that same word again. You know, i got to come up with a different word or whatever. And so it's the same thing when you're doing these things that are creative. There's so much more that goes on about how you sort of bring the whole thing together. Hmm. You know, how you create this crescendo. The crescendo goes flat if you don't build it right. You know, and so it's all of this sort of tedious detail, you know, about materials, spacing, pattern, rep repetition, you know, what kind of paint, what kind of light, which angle, how, what's the distance. And so, you know, um, it, it's just a tremendous amount of that that goes on. But it's also, I like about your work is the fact that um, the work is so stunning and draws you in but there's so much more depth behind it. There's so much in intellect behind it and so much art history. And, um, and part of that, again, too, is your, the luxury of you having been a professor and having to know all this stuff to teach it. You know, you're constantly thinking about these connections and linkages, but you have these epiphanies when you see work. Like you said, when you saw that guy doing this stuff in the 70s or at the auto show with the... The, the lacquer and the rally stripes, you're just kind of like, hmm, I'm going to file that away. <laughs> and, uh, but for, it's those for tricks, years. <laughs> yeah, the tricks of the trade. And so, um, but there's just a, a lot of, um, you know, it's just like the whole thing with the Eves Klein Blue and just, you know, what he did seems so simple on the surface, but it's not. It's not. You right. know, and, uh, and the same thing with, you know, uh, so many other artists where um, it, it seems so straightforward, but it's, years of thinking about it and how it pulls together and that's how the works why they're so successful because there's this aha moment <laughs> you know when you see them and so i think that's uh, what i hope people can see the work in person um we of course will have tons of detailed images online we Great. have videos and 
all sorts of things for people, but if there's any way you could get into Chelsea to see this, uh, this is at our uh, West 26th Street location in Chelsea, New York. Um, these are well worth the experience. And um, so I want to thank Heather. And if you enjoyed uh, meeting Heather and hearing her talk about this work, um, we do these uh, video interviews. It's become a very important part of, uh, you know, sort of my gallery practice because um, it's a way for you as the viewers to engage with the artist and, and the work in a very personal sort of way. I want it to be always casual and almost like a studio visit. Right. And so if you enjoy these and meeting people like Heather on, uh, through the video, uh, then please subscribe. These are on YouTube and they're also on our uh, gallery site. And so uh, that way you can kind of keep up on all the different ones that we have coming along. So thank you, thank and you. Uh, glad you made it to New York. Thanks. <laughs>